And welcome to the fifth round of the World Cup in the year 2000. Phil Liggett along with Paul Sherwin and this the 35th Amstel Gold Race. A long way at 257 kilometres and it brings to an end of the spring classic season as we now move on to the big tours. Well, we're joining the action here now as the riders are making their way onto the Kutenberg, which means there are 72 kilometres still to race. We have a small breakaway in progress and the man up here is the new world champion, Oscar Frere. Well, he's had a fantastic start to the season, Phil, as we look here at Alberto Eli there, the telecom rider. He also, one of the older riders on Team Telecom, but certainly this year having a very good season as well. He started early on, like many riders seem to have done this year in the Vodacom Report Tour in South Africa. And in this group as well there, you can see Yatislav Ekimov. And the Rabobank rider on the back there is the man who was the revelation of last year's season, Mark Wouters, the Belgian rider on the Dutch squad. Well, these little climbs, there are 27 of them throughout the race today, and this is in the south corner of Holland, which is a very hilly little region. Springtime taking a while to get underway this year in Central Europe, uh, but this breakaway has now built a lead of some 3 minutes and 45 seconds. They've been a tenacious lot in the peloton today. They've been catching everything and holding the race together in one big bunch, but this group has managed to break the elastic, at least for the moment. Interesting to note in that group as well, Phil, uh, Dmitry Konishev in the white jersey there of Fasa Bortolo. He's a, a member of this new team, a new Italian team, which has been led by Giancarlo Ferretti, the former team manager of the Ariostia squad. A great team manager who's pulled together a pretty impressive team this year. And in that team, the leader, obviously, Fabio Valdato, had a great start to the season with a good performance in Milan San Remo. But it seems to me as if Konishev is uh, kind of having a rebirth to his career because he had talked about actually retiring from the sport. He felt he was getting a little bit too old. But this season he's been very much to the front. Well, a new team for him as well this year. Now let's look at the peloton here. Martin Dembaka flashing through in his Dutch championship colours. A lot of US postal boys right to the fore. Lance Armstrong among the starters today as well after his brilliant ride one year ago. And Michael Bogart here too. Eric Zabel is the World Cup leader, having had so far a tremendous season, only failing to score in liege baston liege As we're looking now again at the race under pressure. Well, this is the, the par power for the course, really, in the Amstel Gold Race. You see, Phil, there are so many of these steep little climbs here in the, the Limburg area of Holland, right down in the bottom corner there. But once you go over the top of the climbs, it's the wind that actually causes the major effect. You get a group of 10 or 15 riders, and then they accelerate, and these groups absolutely split to pieces. There you can see the Lotto rider very close to the front, that was Andre Schmiel. But certainly this is a race which really is a, a war of nerves towards the end because we do have 27 of these very difficult climbs, 260 kilometers. And as we now come into Ingeberg with 69 kilometers left to go, these guys are a little bit worried about the position really behind of the group coming up. This is Andrea Perron we're looking at right now. And there's the complete composition of the Cop Group, which is the head group in the race. And it's nice to see uh, a world champion on the attack in the year of his reign. He's having a wonderful season, six wins already. Now having had a little bit of a layoff with the strained calf muscle, he's back in the thick of the action and straight up to the leading group. Sat at the back of this race for the moment is Andrea uh, Perron. Good to see Alberto Eli keeping the pressure on. He's obviously trying to do some kind of situation for Telecom to try and get them into a leading breakaway situation today. In the past, although this is a very difficult bike race, Phil, we have seen many bunch sprints towards the end and in fact Jan Raas was almost unbeatable in this bike race over many years and the year he actually did lose it, the rumour at the time was, I was actually racing then, he was told by the race organisation not to win the bike race because he was taking credibility away from it. Well it was true and in fact Jan, they used to call this the Amstel Gold Raas because of Jan's name uh, but uh, I, I actually he was on site for many of those wins by Jan Ross and he was a brilliant bike rider for this one event well he was for generally for events past world champion of course he was actually the starter of the race this morning back in the marketplace at the start and now he is uh, watching the race from a car Sergio Barbero is the man there for the Lamprey squad at the back in the pink and blue jersey. This is a pretty serious move though, Phil. These guys are all working very well together. Once they get over the climbs, they get themselves together and, and try to consolidate on that advantage. But certainly I would think towards the end we'll see a much bigger acceleration, a much bigger participation from the Rabobank team because although they've got Mark Wouters in that team, their number one man really has to be Michael Bogard, the man who won that finish last year in a very close, tight sprint to the line with Lance Armstrong. And it actually had to go right down to the photo. 
Well, there you can see the vigilant big group here. They have been chasing everything down today, splitting up a little bit on the Clydes, but always coming back together. Quite an amazing scene, but you know, that's the sort of trend in the classic races this year. There's the latest gap, 3.25. The field have not been able to find a real leader of the pack and there's a lot of guys riding at the moment who are very equal in ability. Absolutely, riders like Peter Van Pietigem. This, although it's a fairly hilly classic, is a classic that can actually go across to the, the, the chances of a man like this. Barbaro here in a little bit of difficulty as we go down this descent. The next climb of the day, Phil, is going to be the Kauberg as they drop here into Volkenberg. And this is the corner that in fact was used in the World Championships on two occasions back in 1979 when I actually raced it. And you can't believe the number of people there were on the side of the road. Well, this there. is a lovely area, southeast corner of Holland here. It is uh, a holiday part. A lot of the Dutch people come down here for a week or two. And uh, this beautiful scenery here, very varied terrain and plenty of nice cafes and things to do. The Coburg is a 12% climb. It's a wide climb. And as Paul has said, in fact, it was here, Paul, where Jan Ross won his world title back in the 70s. Absolutely an incredible sprint finish. And it was two, two, two years on the run that, in fact, the Dutch took it because the year before, the world champion had been Kerry Kanejeman. Now, the riders here coming through Volkenberg know that they've got this very difficult climb of the Kauberg. Then they drop off it of the top down into the valley once again, then climb back up onto the same main road before heading back down into the town of Maastricht. And once they go into Maastricht, then they've still got a very big loop to do. And that other loop that they do feel actually takes them into Belgium for a short while before coming back into Maastricht for the finish. Connie Chevin Perron in reverse order on the front of the riders here. A chance to look at the colours of Faso Botolo. But there's a massive crowd here to watch the race and the Dutch supporters really love cycling. But this is the only major classic race on their cycling calendar, the Amstel Gold Race. They also have the Tour of Holland, that is their other major race. Other than that, most of the events are held on closed circuits within the small towns. The police don't like closing the roads down as they do for these two major events every year. It is quite remarkable when you think of the number of Dutch cyclists that there are, that there aren't more major events in the actual country. They have to go abroad to race in France and Belgium and even down in Spain and Italy. And surprisingly enough, for a fairly flat country, they produce a number of, of very good climbers. Well, they're heading up after the Coburg. The next climb will be the Musenberg, which will be climb 26 today, and with 40 kilometres left to go. Looking through at uh, Ekimov in his new US postal colours, back with the boys in America, after a brief respite away with Vina Cal Vini Calderola. Just look down there at Volkenberg, Paul. What a massive crowd. And it's a real holiday atmosphere whenever the Amstel Gold Race is on as well. And fortunately today the weather is magnificent. Although a little bit chilly at the start, it was 14 degrees Celsius, which is only just over 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But certainly it's, it's a holiday for the Dutch today. They come out, they wait at a nice point on the course, they find themselves a good bar, they have a few beers, wait for the bike race to come by, and then immediately it's straight back inside to watch the finish on the TV. And how nice when you're the national champion of your country and you're right on the nose of the peloton on the climb of the Cowberg as Martin Dembaka is here. It's the second time he's worn that tricular jersey as champion of Holland. And the big boys are on his shoulder, also off uh, to our right there. We've got Lance Armstrong trying to get his nose up front. What a brilliant ride he had in this event last year. And I think his form, little and sure, is coming good for his defence of the Tour de France. Well, I reckon his preparation has been ideal. It's just about the same as it was this time last year. And Armstrong certainly not overweight like some of the other contenders for the Tour de France later on in the season. Because amazingly enough, earlier in the year, I saw Jan Ulrich Phil at the Vodacom Report Tour. He was looking in pretty good shape. He came back to Europe, put an awful lot of weight on. On the other hand, Armstrong has had a very difficult winter with a lot of places to visit, a lot of presentations to go to. But still he's managing to get himself slowly into the form which should bring him a good attack at that title the Tour de France a victory again this year after a magnificent performance last season. Well, Marcus Zeberg setting the tempo on the front here now and he's come up that at a very quick rate but there's others willing to work here looks like a Palman's rider or is it um Looks like it might be David Rebellin actually who's yes, moved up to be. the front there. He's on the new liquid gas team there that is uh, an Italian team and he's come up here to try and put in a fine performance in these hilly classics. We saw a lot of him in liege baston liege just a week ago. But in fact that little acceleration has split the field over here and this is an attack coming from Andre Schmiel. 
Yes, no cars behind the bunch, so they've got a split in the bunch at the moment. This is the way it's been going, but they've been coming back together again. Now, once over the top of the Cowberg, uh, time is running out for the boys to get across the gap. The latest check we've got now is 2 minutes 45, and they are 47 kilometres from the finish. So they've now covered 210 kilometres in those legs today. A lot of riders from Team Telecom in there. Quick glimpse there of Stefan Weisselmann. A very good bike rider, Western Man has had a fantastic season so far and he's been riding very consistently to the front in all of the classics so far but Martin Timbackerfil is a man who wants to do an awful lot of work at the front for the team. He had a fantastic campaign last year in these series of races, the Flesh Wallon, Liege Baston Liege and the Amstel Gold Race and today he seems to me as if he's doing an awful lot of work and most of that is obviously being done for the team leader Michael Bogard. Well, this is now the long but straight road over the top of the Coburg, where it's recuperation time. The team cars are having a nightmare day today because of the narrow roads, the fact the big peloton is not splitting up at the back. The team cars cannot get through to the riders. They've started to feed the riders now from motorbikes uh, because they can't get to the cars for their bottles. Uh, the Mape cars got in amongst it there, but I think he will be getting an earful from the race referees uh, from the position he was in. This is the leading group. This little climb actually is a little deceptive because you've come over the top of the Cowberg and you think you're going to drop down into Maastricht and what happens is you take a right hand turn off the road, drop down into the valley just on the outskirts once again of Valkenburg and then climb back up to the ridge which takes you slowly down into the river towards the river Maas and Maastricht. The leading group are still riding pretty well together although Mark Wouters, uh, the rider from Rabobank there wearing number seven, looks to be suffering just a little bit and that information will certainly go back to the team management at the back because today Rabobank really want to win this bike race, Phil. It's so important for them, as you said, it's the only major bike race here in Holland and for them to get a win on home ground is primordial. Yes, and last year, of course, it was Michael Bogart who got the victory. He's not had a very good start to the year, actually, but he's certainly in this race today. And back in the main field, as we've seen, two and three quarter minutes back, as the race pressure stays on the front, Alberto Eli going through there. And Yekimov looking for a little bit of the back of the tail. This is an attack here from Sergei Ivanov, the Russian champion, now riding on the Farm Fritz team. And formerly TVM, of course, it's another new team now, sponsorship in its own right. And this man has some tremendous speed in those legs. He tries to rip away from the front, but you see, they'll let nobody go today, Paul. This is very unusual to see such a big bunch at this stage of the Amstel. Absolutely, there's a huge bunch, and it is on the final circuit once we've actually gone through the finish line in Maastricht and out onto that final loop that the attacks are going to come, and I feel certain that then the main field will split. This is what it looks like at the back, though, and it's certainly not very easy at all. The US Postal Rider right on the back of the group here is Tyler Hamilton, and that's not the place that he's normally used to at the moment, but let's not forget Tyler Hamilton is thinking about prospects further down the road, especially the month of July when he's going to be very much called upon to help Lance Armstrong at the Tour de France. Complex year for the top riders this year with the Olympic Games, it always is of course, uh, but it's not just the Olympic Games this year, it's a long way to Australia to compete in them, which means you're taking a big slice out of your cycling season at the time when you really can't afford to do that. Uh, Tour of Spain is slightly overlapping the Olympic Games as well, and of course the World Championships follow and the Classics in October and late August. This is Yevgeny of Spruk, so it's amazing to see this guy. He's had a fantastic classics campaign so far, Phil. We've seen him aggressive in every round of the World Cup so far. So strangely enough, even riding very well there in Liege, Baston Liege, just a week ago. He's a very adaptable rider. He had a great Paris Roubaix, a good start to the season in Milan San Remo as well. And he's always prepared to have an attack. Stefan Weisman now has decided he's going to leap out of the front to try and toughen the race up for Telecom. He's another man that's having a wonderful year too on Telecom. We think him as a new professional, which he isn't, of course, but he's only just really become a big figure in the whole scene of professional cycling. As a, a man in the peace race, the Berlin Prague Warsaw, it used to be called, he has had tremendous results there. I think he's won it three times. Uh, but uh, now he's mixing it on the top team alongside Ulrich and Zabel. This man is coming out in his own right. Absolutely, he's a very strong rider. You can see the build of him though, Phil. He's he's a very squat rider on the machine. He has got a very good sprint when it comes down to the end of a lot of these bike races. And he's now got away over the top of this climb. He will now have to face again the long main road down into Maastricht. And when they do come into Maastricht, they've got that other very tricky and difficult loop 
But the main feel, as you said, Phil, once again, not letting anybody really get too far off the front of the pack because I think they want to keep it together to have a real showdown on this final circuit. And it is a very difficult final circuit with the climb of the, the Mausenberg. And two times they have to go over St. Pe the St. Petersburg, which is a small climb. It isn't really all that much, but just one kilometer. But it's very, very difficult. And that's where we normally see the platform and the big attack coming on the run into the finish line. Well, the wind not annoying the riders as much as normal in Holland today, which to some degree is probably the reason for this bunch staying together so much. There's nothing to break it up with those crosswinds across the barren lands of parts of Holland. The race will pop into Belgium to complete its final circuit before coming back to the finish at Maastricht, where it started some hours ago now. Over five hours, in fact. There's Bortolami on the right of our picture there with the yellow helmets on. And the bunch again, Paul, they've clawed the way back and we've got a huge pack here. Absolutely, it keeps splitting up and joining back together. There's Mauro Gianetti on the far side having a quick chat with Rolf Sorensen. Sorensen, not too happy, I think, that many of the riders not working at the front here and all of the responsibilities being put on his team, the Rabobank team. Well, they are the team of the defending champion, the winner last year, Michael Bogart. And if they want to win this bike race again, they're going to have to do the work themselves and assume all the responsibility. And it's interesting to note that for the first time, we're not seeing a lot of work being done by the Farm Freaks team. In the early season races, like the Tour of Flanders and then Paris-Roubaix, we saw an awful lot of work being done by the grey jersey of Farm Freaks. But today, I think they've decided to tactically cool it down just a little bit and maybe save something towards the end. 52 kilometres to the finish. About 31, 32 miles there. And this breakaway, which has been shaping up for a long time now, and dangled off the front at just over three minutes, is still dangling off the front. There are one or two passengers, not least Mark Vouters on the back here. Looks a little bit overweight to me, Mark. But it's a long year and plenty of time to lose those pounds. But he had a wonderful season last year, winning, uh, first of all, the, the, the Tour of Britain in fine style and then going on to win the Tour of Luxembourg. Sadly, he crashed out in the Tour de France. Well, look at that, Phil. It's two minutes and five seconds. So it's not really coming down very quickly at all, this gap, despite the fact that we can see a long line in the main field of riders really keeping the pressure on at the front of the pack. They're not really eating to, into that advantage. This group of eight riders at the front, that one time they had a lead of over four minutes but it certainly isn't coming down as quickly as I would have expected to on this run here run in here into Maastricht well even Maastricht has got complicated street furniture these days the team cars are relieved at least they can get up alongside their charges now and have a word it looks as though these uh, might be trying to get through to the head of the race and up to the eight leaders they're not going to because it's such a complicated route through here. This is a, a route that takes the riders on a, a small way to get into Maastricht and then in a, a few moments time they'll have to cross over the River Maas and then they will go through the finishing line and once they cross the finishing line they will head out onto that small loop that actually takes them across the border and into Belgium for a very short while and some very difficult climbs as well. Well, these team cars have been waiting absolutely ages. One hasn't got through, but they are trying to get up to that leading group of eight riders. And uh, there's a warning with the red flag there about the split in the middle of the road. Certainly, uh, the Fasa Botolo car has got through. He's gone up to the leaders. He's got two men up there in Peron and Konishev. But the tempo being done, this looks like the style of Andrea Taffy here at the head of the peloton. They are keeping a good tempo, and the gap is still not big. Words of advice now. That's Sergio Passani, the team manager of the Mape squad at the moment and it is so rare Phil to see a world champion riding so aggressively as this man Oscar Ferreira amazing to think that last year he had just 14 days of competition before he went to the world championships and leapt out of that pack in the final kilometer to take only the second uh, world title for Spain which is quite remarkable when you think of Spain as one of the great cycling nations they've only had two world road racing champions Eddie Mazzolini is the Palti rider, that's new colours for him, ex-Seiko. And looking at Dmitry Konishev there, looking for his car, as is Andrea Peron. There's Ekimov, it's coming down two minutes now because Vesemann has gone back into the field. And it's, uh, it's a very tenuous lead, this, this bunch is enjoying the chase, I think, but they're not splitting up at all onto the Petersburg now. Well, this is the Petersburg, it's right after the finishing line. It's a very difficult climb, and very often you can see the main field split up here into small little portions. These are the, the eight leaders, they're still surviving, Phil, and they're now on the way to the little lap that takes them out into the, to the countryside of Belgium, and then coming back here to Maastricht for the finish line. The top of this climb is very often the launch pad for somebody to try and jump away 
on the final attempt at this climb because they come up this climb with just five kilometers to go before the finish but at the moment you can see these guys are keeping very much together trying to work as a very good group as a good unit and they seem to have been doing that but certainly number seven on the back here Mark Wouters trying to get his hand into his back pocket and get some food out there it's very much the policeman for the Rabobank team and I think he's had the order not to work with this group any longer well, tradition dictates that the Amsterdam Gold Race is a battle between all of the Dutch sponsored teams and that they would actually destroy their own chances rather than see a rival win uh, because they don't like victory going to a rival team in this Dutch event. Back to the front here, surveys Canavan of Farm Fleet setting the pace and just uh, on these narrow roads the opportunity is rife now to go for it but nobody is actually breaking this field up they certainly haven't tied, decided to go forward yet Stefan Weissemann was the telecom rider very close to the front and still riding in the top 10 or 15 places Phil I caught another glimpse of Lance Armstrong and maybe he's thinking of a, a little bit of revenge last year because he feels that he was a little robbed in that victory in the sprint towards the finish line because Michael Bogard sat on him on the way down to the line and only just managed to get by him in the sprint and I think a little little bit more experience in sprinting and Armstrong may well have been able to get the win there but it was so close on the line and we also had that incident with the motorbike the press photographer that caused the accident when the four riders were together and we'll never know if Marcus Seberg could have pulled off the biggie now this is Filippo Casagrande just holding on to the back there brother of his more famous Francesco and he's uh, having a difficult time on the climb now the thing is that on these narrow roads you see you're forced into a long line and you have to slow down then it really hurts to accelerate again and there is an acceleration you can see the long line of the main field there one or two riders getting popped off the back over the top of St Petersburg here and the work now is starting to come from the Farm Freaks team on the front we've seen consistently surveys Carnarvon in the grey jersey Carnarvon is tur turning out to be a very good worker for the team we are here in the streets of Maastricht you see we've gone through the finishing line over the top of St Petersburg and this is the finish that the riders will come down a little bit later on when they will just have one kilometer to go but unfortunately they're now going to head out onto a large loop into the countryside well let's see if they can hold it together they are far from safe here in fact I would say they're not going to make it unless somebody livens this group up a little bit there's two riders in the Fasa Botolo team but they don't seem to be doing just more than what they have to. Mark Vouters is not doing anything whatsoever. There's the world champion Oscar Freire wearing that jersey with pride. Six wins this year already. Look at this Phil, somebody's ah. taking a shortcut around <laughs> the corner there. And that's the problem actually with racing in Holland. There are so many of these directional islands, so many of these central bands down the road which are very t steep concrete ba uh, bands that in fact it does cause a whole lot of confusion and everybody's now trying to keep in contact with the bike race. Well, it's uh, every which way as far as the riders are concerned and when they're scrabbling. Let's watch the picture down bottom right there. There's the lone rider. Actually didn't make the corner at all. He did a little bit of cyclo cross there and then good decision to go left and he's got back in the race. I wonder who he was. Well, you can be <laughs> certain that his team mechanic will be checking that out and he won't be too happy because the riders uh, use very special tyres for bike races like this and the mechanics look after them and they scrub them with a brush, they scrub them with sponges and when a rider at the start rides through a uh, a parking lot or takes to the uh, side of the road the mechanics are not too happy about that Eddie Mazzolini and this is a word in the ear of Dmitry Konishev speaks fluent Italian of course has an Italian wife but he's Russian and in fact uh, the team cars are now relieved because they've at last got up to their charges they must have felt rather deserted these boys because the, the narrow roads have meant no help at all for them bottles have been sent up on motorbikes but they're now able to give them a full layout of what's happening behind this car coming through now in fact is the car of the the race director and the race director of the Amstel Gold Race these days is in fact Leo Van Vliet a former top professional rider who raced uh, on the top rally squad for many years and I know Leo pretty well and he's definitely pretty happy to still be involved with the sport yeah most interesting character if I remember rightly, he beat you in your amateur days, Paul, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he certainly did. He actually beat me in a race called the Criterium de Vancours at the end of the season in a small town called Conchester. And ever since that, we always uh, had a pretty good laugh about that. <laughs> well, he did anyway. <laughs> well, that's Leo driving the uh, Mercedes on the right. Very nice car for the day. And this is Oscar Frey here wanting to get on with it, but they're not really at all coordinating now. All the presence of the vehicles here 
has sort of knocked any coordination out of them. They're more interested now in speaking with the management. Yeah, that's always a big problem when the team management comes up to a breakaway like this. Once the guys have been working well together, there always is a little bit of disorganisation coming in when two or three riders go back for bottles or they want to take their coats off or they want to take their arm warmers off. You lose a certain amount of impetus. Oscar Freire, though, is looking pretty good in here, but you can see, Phil, on the main field, this is Surveys Carnarvon on the front. The speed is completely different. They've picked it up an awful lot here in the main group, and certainly I think they're going to start to eat into that advantage, which last time, check we got was two minutes and when we get another one I'm sure it'll be a lot closer to the one minute margin. There was still an awful lot of riders doing nothing here, although uh, believe me there are men being tailed off the back at regular intervals. Quite well known names as well so the form is differing. This is the last World Cup event of the current series until the season resumes after the big Tour de France and Eric Zabel so far and he's in here somewhere I haven't seen him at all today is a good leader of that competition. He's never really bothered with the competition before. He only rode a couple of the events last year and the points he scored on those couple of events would have given him a ninth place overall. But there is a minimum qualifying number of races you must ride, so uh, Zabo didn't appear in the overall result last year. Well, it's amazing to see that, in fact, Eric Zabo is going to have a hard time living out this season, Phil, because it was reputed he'd done 20,000 kilometres of yeah. training before Milan San Remo, and he will have put another five or 6,000 in since then. So certainly he's going to have to take a break, I would think, after this race, the Amstel Gold race, if he wants to be competitive at the Tour de France, and then further forward down the season for the Olympic Games in Sydney. There's an attack here, and this is split up. There's an attack. This has gone at the front of the race here, and I'm not sure, but that's Eddie Mazzolini in the Pulte jersey being joined by Ellie. I think think Konishev and Frere so we missed the attack we're with the bunch but they've suddenly split this field and gone now is Ekimov and Vouters among others well this is the Mausenberg six percent it's not a major climb but it certainly was enough to split the field at the front or the group at the front which was eight riders and that was a very good attack there by Eddie Mazzolini trying to come across now Sergio Barbaro he's missed the split there but he's digging very deep over the top of this climb and you can see Phil the crowds are unbelievable here at the Amstel Gold Race and certainly there will be attacks here in the main group as well on the front it still surveys Carnarvon but there's a big grouping there of Rabobank riders they must be thinking about some kind of plan too. Well there's Cervais up there but I'll tell you what also gone there was poor Andrea Perron caught on one leg by the attack of Eddie Mazzolini We'll see if they get back together once they're over the top of the Musenberg, which is the 26 of the 27 climbs. There are, in fact, 30 climbs in this race, but they don't count three of them for some reason, and just a total of 27 is a part of the competition. Well, the field here on the same climb is still keeping steady tempo. Let's get back up. These are the three dropped riders here, because that is Perron, and we've also got ahead of him Ekimov and Wouters and they look as though they're finished because there's huge tracks of daylight in front of them now. Well that's not going to be too good for Rabobank and they certainly now must come to the front of this bike race. They were counting on this man, there's the gap there, 21 mm. seconds between the leading five riders and the three who've been tailed off but more importantly I think Phil where is the main field because they are hammering along behind and certainly they will be boring down. You can see them clearing the gap now between these uh, three riders and the bunch so certainly I reckon the main field cannot be too far behind the whole of this bike race. Yes, they've sent the neutral service car there past the three on the right to the leading five. Here comes the Express driven by the Farm Freaks boys and trying to get this breakaway now brought back together because they're running out of time here now. We're running out to inside 40 kilometres to go. They need to close it down. But if they do close it down, we are going to be treated, I think, to a bunch sprint of a massive a bunch of riders here and that hasn't happened really uh, since the uh, the days of um, well Jan Ross I would think absolutely I can't imagine that that's going to happen Phil because there are some very difficult climbs still to come those three have actually been brought into the fold by the main field I reckon now or they're about to be at the moment and the gap just 39 seconds Andrea Piron is the man at the back there Yatislav Ekimov doing his job today for the US Postal Service team but Ekimov has had a very good start to the season Phil we saw him win the three days of La Pana which is regarded by everybody as a pointer to the classics condition and then he rode a great Tour of Flanders and a very good Paris-Roubaix as well helping George Hincapi again to a top performance there and Mappe must be absolutely delighted with the way Oscar Freire has suddenly become a big man 
when you win the world title and you've done nothing in your life and then all of a sudden you're thrown in at the deep end but they are bringing him through nicely but he is living in the best company those six wins were not easy wins for him and as you can see now he's enjoyed this breakaway in the Amstel Gold I'm not so sure it's going to stay away but clearly he's got a lot of strength there he certainly has he's a fantastic bike rider and I think he's very lucky to have changed across to Mape because they will build him and actually develop and work with him over the next few years as we look now at the distance between the, the leading group of five Phil and the group of three behind it's just inside the one minute mark and the main field in fact at the moment as we look is right on their tails there's one long thin line of bike riders down there now and it's the Rabobank team who are pulling it along the gap is about 1 minute 20 now so they've halved it and they're closing in slowly but surely but it's still a fair way to go there's still another couple of good climbs as well we're uh, around about uh, 35 kilometers mm. to go to the finish we've still got three more climbs to go Phil and the most difficult one obviously is the Aben which is the next one up followed by the Helenby and then the final climb of the day St Petersburg this is Rolf Sorensen on the front and you can see now a, a change in the tactics of the front of this bike race because a lot of the Rabobank riders now realize that they don't have a man in the brake and the responsibility certainly is theirs if they want to win this bike race again still it is a fairly large group left at this stage of the game and a lot of orange jerseys now coming to the front well the whole point of putting in the Hallam Bay climb at the end was to break up any possibility of a bunch finish well I'm not too sure these boys have been coming back every time they've gone over the top of a climb all the Rabobank team are here now to try and shut down this attack and so too the farm fleet so it's a one-on-one -on -one as far as the Dutch are concerned and that's the shortest gap we've had for a long time they've got them down now to 57 seconds there's Tyler Hamilton just creeping into the shot there so feeling a little bit better in the latter part of this bike race I haven't seen Lance Armstrong for a, a, a short while Phil but I do believe that he is still in the race at the moment and if he is showing the form that he was showing this time last year he must be pretty close to the front of this group of what is around about 65 bike riders now I would say yeah but only one team possibly two doing all of the pacemaking here the rest are waiting for an opportunity to see if this leading group which is now down to five from eight riders this is the day that Holland closes its roads to a big time race the Amstel Gold race started in the mid 60s this event and I must say I've seen most of them over the years and there's been some excellent racing because of the nature of the course this is a very strange pattern today though it is but it's also a very nervous race as well 34 kilometers to go for a lot of these bike riders fill the first part of the course out uh, in the, the the roads of Limburg are very dangerous because of all of these directional islands we're now going to a part of Holland where there are not quite so many the roads are a lot more open and this man is a man capable of winning here today Phil this is Johan Museo the winner of Paris-Roubaix this year and certainly everybody now believing that he's come back to the form that he had before his accident 12 months ago and he really is for me the bike rider the classic rider of the 90s and now he's racing in the 21st century absolutely and the way he won Paris Bay this particular year was superb I was looking there at his leg there was no evidence of the scar of his operation there it may have been on the other side of course uh, but it is the left leg that was so badly damaged an incredible comeback really one of the great comebacks in the sport of cycling because not only did he nearly lose his leg Phil but he almost lost his life and mm. if it hadn't been for his wife who in fact trained as a nurse he probably wouldn't have called the doctors that night and he may well have passed away because he's a tough man he thought well you know it's normal that it hurts after an accident like that I don't really need to go to hospital I'll go a little bit later but his wife said no chance she got onto the um, emergency services and he was taken immediately to the emergency room of the hospital near Ostend and they sorted him out pretty quickly but if it hadn't been that quick reaction by his wife we may not be looking at Johan Museo today hardly bears thinking about here comes Eddie Mazzolini's car new car for him today Polti ex Seiko Alberto Eli grimacing at the back and not looking as though he's going too well now and the poor old team car can't get through try the near side let's not forget Alberto Eli is probably one of the oldest bike riders in this breakaway Phil he's pretty close to 34 years of age Good he's been heaven. around for an awful long time but he certainly is riding very well and he's a man that can be counted on especially for the telecom team when they go through to the Tour de France later in the year you can see now there's an awful lot of pressure there is Eric Decker and Michael Bogard and pretty close to them Lance Armstrong as well 
but now you can see the leading group of five there as we look back down the road you can see the main field have certainly eaten into that advantage and pretty shortly I think we're going to see what we call in Italian Gruco Compacto everybody together and absolutely amazing that is going to be as well Valmir 30 kilometers to go less than 20 miles to the finish and this breakaway is still there and hoping Oscar Freire checking them all out there's Ellie sitting at the back as Paul said he's a bit long in the tooth these days he turned pro in fact back in 1987 so he's one of the uh, the gentlemen of the professional peloton he's had a few wins he's won something like 25 races he's actually held the king of the mountains jersey at the Tour de France as well but he has over the last few years turned into being a very solid bike rider over all the terrains you know he's a he's a tough man and the kind of man that you need when the racing is very hard over the big mountain stages but the man on his inside now wearing the world bands Oscar Freire he's a young bike rider he really is a major surprise to the world of cycling and a fresh surprise as well because certainly having won that title at the end of last year he's come out and proven that the the curse of the rainbow jersey is certainly not on him great to see oh well that's not good news for him either though 35 seconds and the Rabo Banks are bringing this train along right now having taken over from the farm fleet I don't think they can possibly survive now with the climb still to come and 35 seconds only in hand I was about to start to discussing who might win the sprint in that breakaway Konishev or Freer but it looks like it won't matter now it'd be academic because these boys are going to have them very soon Absolutely, they've decided what they want to do. They realise they're coming into the, the tactical part of this course now and they know that Michael Bogart is a very strong bike rider and they reckon that they want to keep this bike race together because they think that he's the man who will be attacking once we get to the next couple of hills. Alberto Eli, I think you're right, Phil, is starting to suffer a little bit on the back of this group and uh, the man who's the freshest and the man who's the most urgent in pushing the moves at the front is Oscar Ferreira, but with 35 seconds advantage, it must certainly all come together pretty soon. Yeah, Barbara who was the last to get across on the split on the Musenberg is actually riding very well now he's recovered and he's taking the line through followed by Mazzolini but Eli has stopped working completely his argument will be well my World Cup leader Eric Zabel is in a group which is coming up at 35 seconds every excuse not to help them break away but the presence of him here at the moment actually takes pressure off oh, the telecom gone. squad in fact, he's decided he's going to move forward mm. and uh, try and keep the group going just a little bit longer because as long as he is here, it in fact takes pressure off Telecom and they can sit in that group. And for Eric Zabel, he's having an armchair ride at the moment because his team has not had to do any work at the front of this bike race. Well, everybody here seems to be giving all they can give right now. It's been a long breakaway for them. Ellie himself driving now as Theo von Vliet, uh, Leo von Vliet rather, goes through on the right of us. Looking back down the road there, Phil, you can see the mm. motorbikes, the motorbikes at the front of the main field, so it's much, very much inside the 30-second mark now. And still Oscar Freire, he doesn't want to give up at all. He wants to keep the pressure on, he wants to try and go clear. And interestingly enough, his tactic today was to go out on the attack because Oscar Freire is proving to be a very rapid sprinter. And I would have thought he would have adopted the attitude of a man maybe like Eric Zabel to sit back and wait and hope there's a group of 25 or 30 riders in with a chance of a sprint to the finish. Well, that's normally the way it should be. But uh, as we pull back here, I think we're going to see a huge pack of riders and there they are. At this stage of the Amstel Gold, it's not unprecedented, but it is highly unusual. Absolutely, the work being done by the Rabobank squad there. You can see the champion of Holland in third place, Martin Dembaka. Himself today being put into a situation where he's having to do an awful lot of work for the team. They didn't have too much pressure on them early on because they did have a man in that early breakaway, Mark Wouters. Now he's been caught by the main group and we're being put into a situation where the Rabobank squad are having to come to the front, support the whole weight of the race because nobody else at the moment is too keen on pulling back those leading group of five. Sorensen swinging off the front here and certainly in that group they're putting a lot of pressure now onto the shoulders of Michael Bogard and it's so very difficult in a race like this to win two years on the run I know Jan Raas was able to do it four years on the run but certainly bike riding has changed an awful lot since the days of Jan Raas and attack now this is Konishev trying to leap off the front well can they I think they've got well they're not going to go anywhere are they now that was the last gasp by Konishev to try and cause a reaction uh, but they're just about spent nobody's too strong to break away from that group of five and this bunch know now 
that they are bringing the Amstel Gold Race all back together again and I don't know how many is down there but it's at least 60 or 70 riders this morning or this afternoon rather from the 190 that started out. Kornishev is carrying on, he's still trying to go over the top of this slight drag in first position but he's really just prolonging the agony because the main field is here. They've picked up the four and in fact there's only just one man resting a little bit further up the road and that's Dmitry Kornishev and pretty shortly they're going to be on his tail and there it is. 27 kilometers from the finish and the catch has been made. Now the riders waiting for who will make the next move. We've still got the steep climbs to come and maybe the organization who slipped this climb in a few years back to try and stop bunch sprinting may have uh, be very wise here now because they may get a group away on that final climb. It's only a short stabby climb uh, but it could hurt the legs. The next climb will be the climb of Eben. Moving to the front there, Phil, a lot of US postal riders getting into the action as well. Maybe they're trying to set something up for Lance Armstrong. Armstrong so far has had a pretty easy bike ride here in the Amstel Gold Race. And he is the kind of man who's got the explosive acceleration on these short climbs in the Limburg part of Holland here to get away and force a group of five or six riders clear. Now, a big chance now. A lot of riders in here are going to feel their chances have suddenly been enhanced. Uh, they'll know how they're feeling, of course. Sprinters can start drooling a little bit, I think. We haven't seen the World Cup leader Zabel, but we understand he is in that bunch. There's been no reports to the contrary. And he's been hiding nicely, but he's going to start thinking again now of more World Cup points at this point. Absolutely. Now a little discussion here at the front. This is Leon van Bon from the Rabobank team having a quick word on the far side with Mark Bouters, who was in that breakaway a little earlier. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what he's saying to Mark. Mark's giving him first-hand impressions of what it's like to be out front for half the race. And he's slipped to the back now. Van Bon hasn't had any performances this year yet. He's a rider that tends to come to form around about June. So he may be a little bit early for him. As they come off these beautiful streets in Holland, these industrial, or not industrial, rather residential streets. But they do have a lot of problems in Holland now with traffic furniture and humps and sleeping policemen, as they call them. Well, everybody's getting a little nervous now, Phil, because next on the agenda is going to be the climb of Aben. And over the top of that, there's only around about 25 kilometres to go to the finish line. saint simeon 4.5%. 27th climb of the day. Two or three riders, four riders managing to force off the pace but you can see the big line there of the main field they really are putting pressure on themselves at the moment trying to get at least a small group of riders clear off the front of this pack well the big team surely can start maneuvering now US Postal trying to get in here here comes an attack by Andre Schmil Schmil always can smell opportunities this man knows when to make moves and test the water and he's giving it a go now Certainly moving forward there as well. The Mappé rider looks like Paolo Bettini, the winner last weekend of Liège Baston Liège. And this is a huge group, Phil. Look at that. It's very rare to see so many bike riders in with a chance at the end of the Amstel Gold Race. Here is the champion of, Be of Holland, uh, Germany, I should say, there, Udo Boltz. He's uh, not riding as well as he was over the last couple of weeks. He shouldn't be riding so close to the back. And Rolf Sorensen still fighting to try and find some form after an early season accident and it's harder and harder as you get older in the career to get over a, a difficult problem like that and Sorensen although he had done a lot of work earlier on finding himself pretty much now near the rear of the pack well he won't have much longer to go he's been around for such a long time Rolf and he's won some great races in his career we'll miss him out the peloton though because he's been a regular for 15 years or so Another attack. This looks like Bettini, is it? It is Bettini trying to get himself off the front. It's not a very steep climb here at the moment, but it's really come out of the front and he is hammering. He must feel like a changed man, Phil, after winning Liège, Baston yeah. Liège. We're now coming into Houtin, Saint-Simeon. It's only a small climb. It's hardly a climb to be called anything at all, 4.5%. But that acceleration has really put the cat amongst the pigeons. And there's a rider from the Lamprey taking over the chase at the front. But it's the only way is to break this field. It could be Ballerini, big Ballerini on the front now. The crowd here was, must be extremely surprised to see the whole field coming through Saint-Simeon. They actually have got a slight advantage here, Phil. They yeah. 
pulled themselves off the front of the main pack, but they've decided uh, that's no good. And on the back of that group was Weinstein's, but here in the group is the World Cup leader, Eric Zabel, wearing number 48. They're still in with a chance. Now, they're going to have to get rid of this guy before the finish if they want to make sure that they can win the Amstel goal race, because Zabel is having a fantastic season. So, he was there all of the time. We hadn't seen him. We thought he was. Now, he knows he has a real chance here of major World Cup points. He is a specialist in the big finishes and at the moment that's the way the Amstel Gold is setting up to be. I think the last group sprint we got was taken out by the former East German Olaf Ludwig which was about uh, eight or nine years ago and normally it's small groups of very rarely more than 30 or 40 men. Well, I'm not sure there's going to be a punch sprint today, Phil, because the time seems to arrive when a lot of these riders want to attack. There's an Onse rider going off the front there, and it may well be Laurent Jalabert. Jalabert is in this group, but it's a much smaller rider, so it could well be that it's David Echabaria. We've seen him riding so well over the last two weeks or so. But Onse now coming to the front of the bike race. We've been seeing so many different teams coming to the front now, Phil, trying to put the pressure on this, this event. And also reminds me, Paul, we haven't seen anything of Laurent Jalabert either. He's in there somewhere too. Absolutely, but Team Telecom are very attentive. A lot of pink and white jerseys very close to the front. And Stefan Weissermann is the man there in third position. Weissermann really is a hard worker. He's not scared of going to the front of a bike race and doing as much work as possible. Well, Onse, the team that's always supported the World Cup events, although for the Spanish, they never seem to do well in the World Cup races. The same applies to Kelme. Uh, but Bernesto are rarely seen here. And now another terrific attack here. Now, this is the only way they're going to break it up. Keep on launching it with lots of power, but they've got to have people willing to come forward and carry it on. Well, that was Sprook, and immediately onto his tail was Andrea Taffy and Stefan Weissermann once again looking for the move today. Stefan there on the left-hand side, but Taffy, boom, immediately across and onto his tail. All back together. Weissermann sits up and plays around in his back pocket there. Jerome Blylevens, a Palti rider, and one of the big transfers of this winter season coming across. Surprising to see your own Blylevens still in with a chance as well, Phil, because uh, Blylevens normally has a very difficult time here at the Amstel Gold Race, and he will be moving forward now to try and hope that if there is a split on the next couple of climbs, he's going to be in the front half of the main field. He too is a man really looking for good early season form because he hasn't had the start to the year that he normally has. And that was Sergio Barbaro, who was in the breakaway there, who was just uh, touching Blylevens. And at 22 kilometres to go, it looks as though the Telecom boys, Ralph Aldag on the front here, are now driving for Eric Zabel. Zabel must have said something to them because they've taken control now. And look at this ripper off the left. Well, that's Taffy. You can't mistake that style straight out of the main field. He's a great bike rider, Phil. <laughs> I love to see him racing. He uses the motorbikes all of the time. He tries to catch out the cameraman just to get a little bit of a slipstream off that machine. And he's not doing anything wrong at all. It's the motorbike from the TV who has to get out of the way. Well, well that was an absolute absolute scorching attack because I thought the bunch were going pretty quickly till Taffy came by but I would think that right about now his legs are screaming he's a star I really love to watch him race he's unbelievable the style of him when he comes out of the pack let's just have a look at that one more time you know they're going full ball there's Aldag on the front of the main field looking for his teammates and bang Taffy hits them well, that's a fabulous attack, and that's the way to do it, but I'm not so sure after an effort like that he can keep it going. This has been a very quick race today. It's in excess of 41 kilometres an hour as we go under 20 kilometres from the finish now, but it's not an easy 20 kilometres. It certainly isn't. We've still got two very difficult climbs, 91 there. We could get a quick glimpse of Peter van Pietigem. He's a good bike rider, van Pietigem, and he certainly would be looking for a chance here to come out with a victory because it looks at the moment, Phil, as if we are going to be treated to a very large group because we still have got at least 50 bike riders in with a chance here of taking out the Amstel Gold Race. Well, it's a long straight road, hardly conducive at this point to a breakaway, but there's four or five riders trying to get it all together here. This is Taffy. And this is the next man coming along. It looks as though it might be Vesseman. And in fact, fact Alexander Vinukarov. Yeah. A very similar style, a short, punchy style of this young man. Another of the great winter transfers. We've had a lot of very important transfers during this winter season. Vinukarov has been brought across from the former casino team, and he's certainly 
looking forward to the Tour de France, a winner of the Dauphiné Libre, a very great climber. And these are the events where we start to see the climbers for the first time, Liège-Bastogne-Liège, Flèche Wallon, the Amstel Gold Race. And certainly that was a great move by him to get across there, but it looks now as if one of the farm freaks riders is trying to get across the gap. Well, we'll see if we can get up to him very shortly. We've got Veinstein's also in the pack. There he is, 132. Number one, Michael Bogart. All of a sudden, he's taking an interest at the front of the race now. This is a very different bike race this year, and Taffy has started what he hopes will be a breakaway. But in fact, uh, Vinokurov has gone forward. There's two more coming across here, and this looks like Martin Dembaka latching on and getting right onto the back there as well. That's Giuliano Figueres, a very good teammate of Paolo Bettini, the, the man who won last week, Liege, Baston Liege. Now this is looking like a serious move and this will be a nice move for the Mape riders because they'll have two riders in this leading group. But look how difficult it is for Martin Dembaka to get onto the wheel of those riders in front. But actually, as we speak, Phil, it's all coming back together. <laughs> well, I didn't expect that. I thought that group was certainly going to go places, but obviously, Thinking about the possibility of a win for Vinnie Calderillo moving forward here, you can see Mauro Gionetti, they are all working for Francesco Casagrande. Casagrande will think, I think mainly Phil, about an attack on the final climb of the day, the St. Petersburg. Well, we saw how good he was on the Hui, the wall of Hui, at the end of Flesh Wallon when he stomped up there and took the victory. Right, now this has got to be showdown time in the Helen Bay, it's 18%. It is a nasty climb, and those with any legs left have got to put home the hammer now. Second position there is Peter Van Pietigem. This is the back of the main field, and it certainly is more than 60 bike riders, and this is the point where they really are suffering. The sprinters now will be holding on. Peter Van Pietigem launches an attack here down the gutters. As Peter goes, you saw the hands go by Vina Calvini Calderola there saying, come on, this is a move, we've got to get with it. Well, decision time, boys. Here comes Bettini, winner of Liège, Baston Liège in fine style. David Rebelin looks like he's making a move at the head of the field as well. But look at this serious effort by Peter Van Pietigam. He's another great bike rider. You know, he's not a very good climber, but certainly on these short, explosive climbs that we have in this part of Holland, he knows how to jump out. He uses a sprinting ability, the kind of speed that he's learned on the track. He trains on the Ghent track throughout the winter season, but you know they still haven't ah. snapped the elastic. Paolo Bettini is trying to get onto the wheel of Van Pietigem, and as we speak, in fact, David Rebelin coming across there as well. And a little bit further back, it's another rider from the Rabobank team, and this looks very much like the big face of Eric Decker. So we've now got all these riders, this is Bogert, this is last year's winner who's come across. And so we've now got four or five riders here making the best of the tailwind. But, and there's a group, there's a depth. Veinstein has just come across as well and that is Marcus Seberg, the rider who might feel robbed last year when that accident with the motorcyclist uh, caused him not to be in at the kill with his famous sprint. A bit further down, this is Yatislav Ekimov at the back of another group. Ekimov has been in the front of the bike race for an awful long time. And this may well be the decision, Phil. This may well be the time that the group has gone. Two of the riders in this group were in the front of the Amstel Gold Race last year. The man sitting on the back there, Marcus Seberg. The man there wearing number one, last year's winner, Michael Bogard. But Peter Van Pietigam is the man who really blew this race apart on that climb there of Helan Bay. And that was a great move by him. And what he needs now is for the rest of this group to start working. There is Paolo Bettini, the winner of Liège Baston Liège. The big rider coming through here from Palmers is Van Dijk. Yes, that's right. So he makes up the seven. Uh, we missed that one, but all seven are here now. If they got down to the finish, of course, Zerberg is a big candidate for a win. And there he is. So uh, injustice last year when a carelessly parked motorcycle took out two of the four leaders. He was one of them. And you know he might well have won that race in the sprint. As it was, Bogert just hung on uh, to beat Lance Armstrong. And I said at the time, if it had been anywhere except Holland, Armstrong would have won. I think the extra home power there uh, brought him over the line first. Absolutely. The last lunge for the line was the most important one. Now, this is a pretty serious-looking group here, Phil, because now there's two Rabobank riders in the leading group, and they'll be pretty confident about that because they're both very good winners. Mm. They will, though, have to try and get rid of Peter Van Pietigem because he, for my betting, is the fastest man in this leading group, the cop group with the two riders there from Rabobank, Bettini, Van Pietigem, Weinsteins as well, a man who has had a very good early season campaign and he's wearing that sort of mauve and white jersey as the champion of Latvia. 
Wayne Staines is a man of the future, very much so. We're going to be talking about him for many years to come. There he is on the far side of the camera. And still the memory card team now. There's a new team on the front working hard here. Well, they've had Tristan Hoffman in trouble at the back of the field today, which is unusual for Tristan. He's such a man for the classics, but he's having an off day perhaps. This he's looks like Taffy on the front. He won't be too happy at that either, Phil, because having a, such a great season in the, in the Classics, he really was looking forward to performing well here at the Amstel Gold Race. And uh, that's just the way it goes in bike riding sometimes. You can have a, a bad day, and especially in your own country, well, that doesn't go down too well. The Francis de Jure rider there, in fact, uh, in second position is Frédéric Guédon, a winner last year of the, a winner a couple of years ago, I should say, of Paris Roubaix. And the man just in front of him was Stefan Herlo. 15 seconds between the leading group and this group here and still an awful lot of US Postal Riders in there. Good to see as well. Ralph Valdag giving us a nice strong look at the camera as he went through there. There's Vyacheslav Yekimov still here. He's done well to hang on really, hasn't he? Because that was a tough breakaway they were all in earlier. And at the back there, the Mape rider, one of my favorite bike riders, Wilfred Peters. A definite number one man to have if you have to pick your dream team in professional cycling you would always want a man like Wilfred Peters there mm. because he is such a stalwart such a tough worker always ready to come to the front and work when needed and always has great morale as well well this is the leading group here what win there was was strong and right behind them on the climb you see by the Belgian flags there because that's where we are right now these are roads in Belgium was right behind uh, the leading group when Peter van Pietingham attacked He's pulled away some excellent quality bike riders, but I don't, no, I'm not so sure the whether they can stay away because the vigilance of that group today has been something special. The last year's winner, number one, Michael Bogart. It's always nice to come back and do it again, of course, at least appear in the attacks if you can't do it. Climber St. Pierre, 8% and Telecom now. I think that's Vesseman on the front. Yeah, but if, what's more important, Phil, there in fifth place there, you caught a quick glimpse of the white jersey of the leader of the World Cup. Telecom have now decided they want to shut this bike race down. They've got a fairly good group. They know now that there's only this climb and then the final climb of St. Petersburg to try and keep this race together. So they're going to try and pull back the leading group and try and keep Eric Zahn at the front of this bike race for the final two climbs of the day and then he's certainly got a great crack at taking the victory but the most important thing to do is to try and pull these riders back at the moment and looking at the man who wears number one Michael Bogart he doesn't look that fantastic no he doesn't and this group does and they're coming back together again Mercatoni Uno having a little dig here now Looks like Marco Velo trying to get off the front there, trying to break up the big charge on the front of Team Telecom. Team Telecom will not let him go too far off the front, but they'll keep themselves organized. And in fact, that acceleration there from Mercatoni Uno has brought the seven leaders almost back into the main field. And in that main field, Eric Zabel, Johan Museo, and still Laurent Jalabert. It's impossible to pick a winner right now. This group is going absolutely nowhere as we turn back towards Holland. Those seven leaders, we think it's Marco Velo bridging the gap down there for Mercatoni Uno, but it won't matter, it'll all be academic in a minute. Our cameras are out of it now because of the proximity of the bunch, but we can see everything here as the catch is made for oh, the there's helicopter. A crash, there's a crash, you're right. That's going to be a major importance well, what to the bike race. Caused that? I think they were all scrambling to the left-hand side of the road, trying to stay on the wheel of the man in front of them, and boom, they all went down. And that will split that main field, but the telecom guys were all in the front. Well, there's the split that we see, and I wonder if our cameras realised it, because I don't think they have, actually. The helicopter's continuing the race. Well, we saw what appeared to be a pile-up. They split the field, don't know who's in it at the moment, but we've now got three bunches here trying to make echelons in the crosswind. Well, that was unbelievable. They went down like a bag of potatoes, and it was certainly somebody touching the wheel of a rider in front, and still, this will give the advantage a little bit to the riders off the front here, because a certain amount of chaos will come. Let's take a look at that once again. Well, watch to the right of our picture here, and goodness knows how it came to happen on the road. There it is, a touch of wheels. The two riders have gone, possibly three. They must have touched wheels, Paul. Unbelievable the way they went down. They just went down, bang, and then they were on the ground. It's one of the riders from Faso Bortolo who's gone down there, I would think, because this is the, the rest of the main field trying to move forward to the front of the bike race. It could well have been somebody like Andrea Perron who was involved in that, but the guys we're looking at now are the guys who've been blown away from this Amstel Gold race at the moment, and they are not really in with a chance of a kill. 
Right, as we look here at the race leaders now, still struggling to come together as they descend off the climbs, they're all together again. We are hearing that in fact Lon Jalabert has been involved in that crash and is out of the race and possibly on his way to hospital, so let's hope he's okay. Well, that's really unfortunate for Jalabert because he was having a pretty good race. He rode very well last week in Liège, Baston Liège. He did a very good flesh well on, so his season was starting to hot up. And I hope for Laurent Jalabert that uh, it's not too, uh, too, too much of a problem there. This is the big river, the Mars, the Meuse, they call it in France. And this is the race where we cross over and then head down towards Maastricht for the very last time. And very shortly, Phil, we will be looking at that final climb of the day, the uh, St. Petersburg. We're back towards Holland again, and that was Bettini leading the charge. Uh, these riders are sticking together like glue today. I must borrow some of that when I go out with the boys training because this has been a very, very good race in many ways, but disappointing in others because the riders are just allowing nothing to get away. They're scrambling it back together again, but there's a split now and ironically caused by the crash. And it looks to be 16, 17 riders up there. Absolutely, you can see them. And now this is the, the rest of the main field are just trying to get down that descent. It's a very tricky descent, but for these guys, it's basically all over. They're more than a minute behind those two groups, which are much further up the road at the moment. And that 17-man group is going to be very important. But there's a man trying to get across at the moment as well. We saw just a few moments ago from the helicopter. And I think it would be interesting to see whether or not Eric Zabel has made it across on the descent. Let's see if we can identify some of these riders now because this could well be at last the split that makes the Amstel Gold Race this year. And that's Stefan Wesserman for sure there, having a little dig and he looks over his shoulder, but there's the split pole. I do believe it's coming back. Well, it really is going to go down to the last few kilometres here. The blossoms there, you can see springtime really making this a remarkable day today for the Amstel Gold Race. But what a great move by Stefan Wesserman and they haven't actually taken up the chase behind him, Phil. And he is a tough bike rider, you know, if they don't chase him down soon, he could well find himself riding to victory. Passing one of the big locking systems here on the Meuse, or the, uh, down the road that takes us, splits Holland and Belgium and Germany and France. And we're coming back over the bridge again, and it is Stefan Westermann who's made his move and gritting his teeth. Difficult ride, a long straight road alongside the river here. He's just going to have to go. He has that wonderful style. He always keeps his head up and crouched forward on his end of his saddle. And uh, it's not the sort of streamlined ducking and diving style we often see. Well, you can see now, Phil, that in fact there is no organised chase behind. Still groups of four or five riders trying to get across. And that will give the advantage to that leading group of 17 men at the front of the bike race at the moment. But certainly we still do have a very difficult climb to come over. Well, this looks to me as though it might well be Johan Musea or is it Wilfred Peters? It's Wilfred Peters who's got himself in the split there with the Palti rider. Peters, always a man to be counted on trying to pull the bike race back together. He's obviously been given a little bit of freedom today there. The man on the far side is Bart Voskamp, the, the, the Dutch rider on the Palti squad. He too is trying to pull himself up to that leading group of 17. But it's still so much anybody's race here and the riders know it. And as they come here now, now there's a shutdown here. The Vini Calderola boy is not too happy and nor are the Lamprey riders. And so they've had a slowdown, and if they allow that to happen, then of course the break is gone. It'll be interesting to see, although, uh, Phil, we did have a lot of those riders from Team Telecom on the front. I'm not sure whether or not Eric Zabel is in this group. Roman Weinstein certainly is, 132 there. Champion of Latvia, a very good man when it comes down to the finish. And on the front, it's Team Telecom setting the pace, so that looks like Stefan Weissermann. It looks as if his breakaway came to naught, and he's now decided to change tactics now and ride for the team. Now, where is Zabel then? Zabel, as far as I know, is not in this 17. He's back in the main field. And the gap there, you can see, is actually stretching out. There's yeah. no chase there at the moment. You can see one or two riders trying to get across. If anybody has got the power, that gap is not too big to be able to leap across on this final climb of the day, the St. Petersburg. And they will be getting there very shortly. There, in fact, look at that, Phil. That is Oscar Freire and Eric Zabel in this leading group. Now, that is pretty impressive. Oscar Freire was in that breakaway for an awful long time. He went clear over the Gutenberg, and he's still in the bike race. But Eric Zabel, he must be really twitching now. Well, 
if he gets a big load of points today, then I think he can put his feet up for the rest of the World Cup season. To be quite honest, he has a good lead already. And remember that his big danger man at the moment, Johan Museu, on the Schmil, aren't in this move. And that is why Vesseman now is not going to look over his shoulder. He's going to go as long and hard as he can. But what a lovely ride by Oscar Freire, the world champion, in that earlier break, which is a very difficult break. And he's still looking for the moves right now. Well, here's Johan Museo there, number 13. And this is the point where we're just about to turn off this big main road, Phil. This is the group behind, actually, the leading group of 17, a lot further up the road. And they will switch across to the left into that central reservation there, and then a sharp left, and they will go up the climb of St. Petersburg. This is Christian Moreau, the rider from Festina. He's making a late burst, trying to get himself up to that leading group. But really, he should have saved it for that final climb and tried to leap across on the incline. Well, I think it's Lely and Rick Verbruggen who's trying to chase behind Moreau. This is the climb now for the leaders. This will be interesting. This is the last chance for the non-sprinters now at the 7% climb of the Petersburg. Then it's a case of running into the finish, something like three or four kilometres. That's all that's left. Seiko rider on the back there was Laurent Dufault. That was good to see him riding so well to the front of these very hilly races. Still, the pressure on the front is coming from Team Telecom. They're going to make this a very hard climb field to make sure that there aren't any attacks because there are some very good attacking riders in the group. In the group, we've got the winner from last year, Michael Bogard. We've got in this group as well, Van Peter Gem. He will be looking to try and accelerate. And also sitting on the back there, Pat Jonker, the Aussie, the Aussie Dutch rider on the US <laughs> Postal Service. He's come over to the US Postal Service, and I think US Postal will be delighted to see a bit of sign of form from Patrick who comes from Australia, but his father's Dutch, so he's never sure who he's racing for. Well, I think he's racing for Holland, this, for Australia this year, because with the Olympic Games coming up yeah. at the end of the season in Sydney, he feels he's got a great chance of representing Australia, which means now he won't be able to revert nationalities again, because he can only do it once during a career. Right, and I think he's been the, Austra the Dutch time trial champion and the Australian time trial champion over the years. He's not a sprinter, he's a workhorse, a former winner of the Route de Sud and uh, had a very good ride one year in the Tour de France. Now, there's somebody stepping on the gas at the front there and it looks like David Rebelin. Well, well look at this little man scurrying up the climb. Everything he's got now to try and get the gap. And if he's got it, Paul, over the top, he's about two miles from the finish. Absolutely. This is the place where you have to launch the attack here if you want to try and win alone. And David Rebelin knew just exactly where he was going to move. Telecom were trying to keep the pace high, Phil, to prevent an attack like this going clear. But David the Rebelin has really hit them. This now looks very much like the shape of Vinukarov. He's done his job at the front for Team Telecom and he's getting blown away from the bike race. Re Rebelin at the front there has around about 150 meters. But what's important now is to try and organize the chase behind him. Well, it's not the first time we've been down this road today, so they know the way now. And David Rebelin here, his leaky gas colors, they're quite attractive colors really for television, has made his move. He's got the gap now. Can he go and finish it off with a great classic victory? Absolutely, he's got to get off this small road now and then into town. He drops down just a little bit, then it's a right-hander and he's in the finishing straight. At the moment, Phil, he's keeping that gap at 200 metres. This is a do-or-die effort. The group behind has certainly split to pieces and you can see right up there, very close to the front in second position there is Oscar Ferreira. He's having a great bike ride today. Now watch out for him when it comes down to the sprint at the end. So Rebelin, a very consistent player in the world of cycling, looking for the great win now as he's got a wonderful gap over the field here and a chance to settle in. It's his steady downhill for a few minutes and maybe he can lift it. He's taken one look over his shoulder. You can see him right in the distance, but the chase is on. Well, the Rabobank riders, they're not able to do anything at the moment. It'll be interesting to see just who is chasing at the front of the pack there. It looks as if it's a Mappé rider from here, and it may well be that that is Paolo Bettini, because in the group there is Oscar Freire, the world champion. But the speed is on here in the Amstel Gold Race, Phil. We're just coming off now. The gap advantage is six seconds for Rebelin back to the group. He's in the town. He won't have too much to worry about the wind at the moment. He's got a right-hand turn onto the main street here of Maastricht, then another right-hand turn, and he'll be inside the finishing straight, and he will see the banner across the line. Fifth in this race. That's his best ever finish back in 1994. Not quite the same course then, but even so, he knows the route as well as anybody. It's a slightly bit built man, doesn't have a sprint, he's got to hang on here. It's a very, very long running, and we're now onto the main road into the town centre here. They look to me from the air as though they are closing it down. 
Well, it still looks to be around about the 100 meters. Somebody's taking up the pace, making at the front a change of leaders on the front of this group. Very shortly, we'll be inside the 1,000 meter banner, and there it is. And this group is really hammering down. Pat Yonker taking up the last position. We're going down now alongside the bridge, which takes the cars over the River Meuse, or the Mars, as they call it here in Maastricht. And he's now very shortly going to turn right here, Phil, and he will be in the finishing straight. Well, this is a fabulous effort, Paul, by these riders, but I think uh, Rebelin, you know, he's thrown down the towel, but surely he can't hold off the sprinters. He hasn't got the gap. Well, he's got to keep going, but look on the front of the main field, the pink and white jersey there, that is Stefan Weissermann. Right up behind him in the bunch there is the man who was the world champion, Oscar Freire, and the leader of the World Cup, his own teammate, Eric Zabel. Moving up there, Andre Schmiel as well. Well, Schmiel is doing well here because if he scores some points, of course, he's going to close the gap. As Schmiel, the winner of the Tour de Flanders, we've got Zabel, the winner of Milan San Remo. And this is a real run at them now. Bettini's here, the winner of Liège, Baston Liège, and Rebelin now racing for the line. It's such a long way to the finish here in the Amstel goal. That's the straight, and he's not going to hold the sprinters off. You must feel sad for him for that. Here comes Zabel on the right now. Is this going to be a magical result for the German having his best season? Yes, it is. Zabel takes it, and Zaberg was pipped there by his teammate Bogart, but they got second and third for the Rabo. Fantastic sprint there, Phil. We can see that Rabobank were trying to get themselves into the finish, but they couldn't do it. A flying Eric Zabel, and he's got maximum points. So there is the melee down at the finish. This is the sprint finish here by Eric Zabel. Round five of the World Cup, his first win in the Amstel Gold. And my goodness me, that man surely is well on his way to winning the trophy as we now go into the halfway period where we take a break from World Cup racing and go back into the big tours of the year 2000. A very different Amstel Gold race, a tenacious bunch, and at the end of the day, taken out by the World Cup leader, last year's champion beaten in the sprint, Michael Bogart. He should feel happy about that. And Marcus Zaberg getting third, and in fairness, that's a great result for Zaberg after his big disappointment last year when he was almost in at the kill until he was knocked off by a motorbike. It was a different Amstel Gold race. Whether it was a great one, I'll leave you to decide. For Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Liggett saying, see you all again shortly.